Good morning. I welcome you all to our service of remembrance. We also welcome the residents in the residential care home who may be watching this service as it is being relayed. We open our service with the singing of And Mighty Fortress is Our God, and that will be followed by our Padre, Captain Judith Dill, for her message in leading us in this service. Thank you. Prayer of Remembrance. God our Father, we remember before you with pride and thanksgiving all those who have died for their country in time of war and especially those whom we have known. In order that we may honour their memory 
and to fulfil your will, we pledge ourselves to seek those things which make for peace and to pray and work for that day when the whole earth will be full of knowledge of your love. So help us to look for the coming of your kingdom of justice and mercy in all the world. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible reading this morning is taken from both the Old and the New Testament. Daniel 12, verse 2a. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. And in Matthew we read, Jesus began his teach, to teach his disciples, saying, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Because of the current uh, world situation, and before I speak of an Adelaide war hero, I would like to read a condensed account by South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who lived 1931 to 2021. He envisaged God's dream for the world through a message of hope, justice, peace and inclusion. Dear child of God, before we can become God's partners, we must know what God wants for us. I have a dream, God says. Please help me to realise it. It's a dream of a world whose ugliness, squalor, poverty, its war and hostility, its greed and competitiveness, its alienation and disharmony, are changed into their glorious counterparts, when there will be more laughter, joy and peace, where there will be justice, goodness, compassion, love, caring and sharing. I have a dream that swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning books, that my children will know they are members of one family, the human family, God's family, my family. This account was the dream for humans of all races, economics and faiths. And Archbishop Tutu especially mentioned countries where conflicts are currently raging today. The results of death despair and destruction are beyond our comprehension, as was evident in the wars fought by our citizens. I would like to share a condensed article from Fallen Saints by Robert Kearney. Philip de Quetville Robin was born at Norwood in 1884 and attended St. Peter's Collegiate School between 1897 to 1900. Whilst at the school, he served two years in the senior cadets, was a keen student and proved to be an all-round sportsman who displayed exceptional ability as an Australian rules football player. After leaving school, he was employed at the Mercantile House of GNR Wills and Co in Adelaide, and later as an accountant with the city branch of the Union Bank, until taking up an appointment with the Murray Bridge Bank of Adelaide. 
Philip played his first league football game for the Norwood Football Club against Port Adelaide in 1907 and the following year became a regular player and was widely acknowledged as one of the finest wingmen in the game and frequently played in interstate games. He played in South Australia's victorious carnival team in 1911 and that year received the Norwood Football Club's award for best and fairest player, which made him the earliest player on record to receive the award. He played for the senior team for eight years. When war broke out, Philip enlisted at Morfittville on 24th of August, 1914, and sailed for Egypt aboard the Ascanius as a member of A Company, 10th Battalion, in October. After transferring from the Prince of Wales early in the morning of the landing, Lance Corporal Robin was in the prow of one of the battalion scouts' boats. Their orders were simple. After getting ashore, they were to, and I quote, go like hell to the third ridge. Upon the reaching the shore, they scrambled through the scrub, and go like hell they did, with he and Private Arthur Blackburn winding their way inland, all the way to, and even past Scrubby Knoll, the main objective. This was a remarkable achievement, and although they did not know it at the time, Robin and Blackburn had achieved the commander's intent by penetrating further inland on the first day than anyone else in the entire campaign. Lance Corporal Robin was killed within two days of the landing and although a number of documents in his service records state he was killed in action on the 25th of April. His little book for Nellie, his wife, has the last entry, dated 26th of April. Almost a year after, Philip's father was notified his son had been killed in action on the 25th of April. He wrote to base records to query the date of his son's death. Mr. Robin informed the OIC that Philip's death must have taken place on the 27th, for by then he had received Philip's book, which was completed up until the 26th of April. A number of documents held by Robin's family members, including this excerpt from a letter Colonel Price Weir, the commanding officer of the battalion, wrote to Nellie on May the 3rd, 1915, and I quote, It is with feelings of deeper sympathy that I have to inform you that your dear husband was killed whilst fighting in the trenches on Wednesday, April the 28th. He was a brave and gallant soldier, and as a scout was one of the first to rush the position held by the Turks on Sunday morning, April the 25th. I landed at the same time as your dear one. The Turks who occupied a hill on the beach, when we landed, poured their deadly bullets into our boats before we were in water shallow enough to jump out, and it's a wonder any escaped. We have been under heavy fire from the moment they sighted our boats until now, 9am, May the 3rd. All our trenches had to be dug under heavy fire. Their shrapnel is very deadly. It was indeed unfortunate that your husband, after getting through the first three awful days, should have been shot. In a late letter dated 15th of August, 1915, Nellie, wrote to a friend of Philip's in London to thank her for her kindness in writing to express her sympathy and said how Philip had planned to take her to London after the war to introduce them 
and as she was planning to visit there soon, hoped they would still meet. Nellie wrote, It's been such a terrible time. One couldn't think of the worst happening when one saw all those fine fellows in Cairo, and we too were so happy. I thought he must come back to me, and now all the joy of life has gone, and each day makes the realisation of one's loss more and more keen. They did their bit so nobly and were so brave that it must make those who belong to them feel they must do their best not to fail. But it is dreadfully hard to face it bravely always. He was so dear. Sadly, Nellie did not live to see her beloved husband's friends again, for she died in childbirth in November before the Gallipoli campaign ended. News of the death of Mrs Irene Nellie Robin, wife of the late Corporal Phil Robin, who was well known and widely popular in South Australian football circles, and her infant son at Kensington, London, was received in Adelaide by a cable message on Saturday. Philip Robin is listed on the Australian War Memorial Roll of Honour and the Commonwealth War Games Commission's Debt of Honour Register as having lost his life on the 28th of April 1915. He was 30 years of age, lest we forget. Let us remember before God and commend to his keeping those who have died for their country in war, those known to us whose memory we treasure and all who have lived and died in the service of humankind. Amen. Thank you, Judith, for sharing just that one story. You do remember all those who gave their lives. Service member David Polner will firstly lay the wreath on behalf of the RSL sub branch, Glenn. David was called to national service in 1954 and trained at Point Cook, Victoria, in the RAAF for six months as this was the total training period time at that time. I call on you, David, to please lay the wreath. Thank you, David. Anyone else wishing to lay the place, place um, flowers or a sprig of rosemary, which is down the front, you are welcome to do so now. Thank you.
Those who are able, would you please stand for the remembrance service? This is the hour when we remember our fallen comrades and those who have since passed on. We remember our members, Maury Hooper and Ryan Chapley. They shall grow not old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn, at the going down of the sun. And in the morning we will remember them. We will remember them.
Let us pray. Almighty God and most merciful Father, you want the kingdoms of the world to become the kingdoms of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to give your blessings on all who work for peace and right among all people, so that that day may soon come when war will be no more and only your will will govern the nations on the earth. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand, we invite you to, and we'll sing, Abide With Me. Thank you. <laughs> Concludes our remembrance service this morning. I have a few announcements to make. First of all, I wish to thank St Andrew's congregation for allowing us to use this church for this service. Thank you, Padre Judith, for your conducting of the service and your message. 
Thank you to Dawn Fisher, our organist. Thank you to Albert Oates for singing the solo, Let There Be Peace. Quite appropriate for the times that we live in. Thank you, David Polner, for laying the wreath. Thank you to Vivian Gore for making the wreath. Thank you to Denise Henderson for the lovely floral arrangement. Thank you to Robert Meany for operating the sound and your PowerPoint input. Above all, we thank you for attending this service. And I'd just like to add here, this morning I had heard a very good 12 minute or so interview with the President of the RSL South Australian Northern Territory talking on radio. And he quoted off by saying, Remembrance Service, Remembrance Day. A lot of the young people do not know anything about Remembrance Day. Isn't that quite appropriate, James Jury? Uh, I thought of James straight away because James has written a second book on the Australians at war. But he spoke quite sincerely. Anzac Day, everybody knows, but Remembrance Day seems to be a thing of the past, but so much happened on Remembrance Day. I believe it was the first time that the Australians held the minute silence at 11 a.m. Would that be right, David? I don't know, but that's what he said in the quote. Our apologies for having to cancel the sausage sizzle. It uh, just didn't work this time. We apologise for that, but Cafe Schulz is open. Our next general meeting is 17th of November. Senior retired police sergeant John Minigal will be telling us what he was involved in at the police academy. You are all welcome to attend these meetings. You do not have to be a member, but we would like you to be a member to enjoy the rest of the day. And thank you once again for your attendance. It's greatly appreciated. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. <laughs>